bit colder still. My name is Michael Flatte. I'm a member of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, this is the second in a series of distinguished public lectures brought to you by the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Leaders in the field from the University of Iowa and other institutions have been invited to provide an introduction to areas of great current excitement in physics and astronomy. We would like to acknowledge the encouragement of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the support of the Office of the Vice President for Research for this lecture series. There's a website for the lecture series that is linked from the departmental website. In our first public lecture, the series we heard about the nature of the earliest times in the universe. In March's lecture, we will hear about the status of a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The SETI Institute's Dr. Jill Tarter will speak on March 23rd on life, the universe, and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence in a nutshell. Manipulation of matter and energy at the near atomic level is the subject of fundamental research and is an engine driving technological innovation. On April 13th, Cornell's Professor Dan Routh will speak on nanoscience and technology, a progress report. In the last 30 years, the smallest pieces of matter and energy have been fitted into a nearly complete picture of the workings of the subatomic world. University of Iowa's Professor Mary Hall Reno will speak on May 4th on neutrinos messengers from the biggest explosions in the universe. Man-made probes have visited many of the objects in our solar system and every time brought a surprise and wonder. This is the area of research of today's speaker, Professor Donald A. Gurnett of the Physics and Astronomy Department at the University of Iowa. Professor Gurnett began working on spacecraft electronics as a student employee at the University of Iowa in 1959. He received his BS degree in electrical engineering in 1962 and his PhD in physics in 1965. He then joined the faculty here at the University of Iowa and has remained here to this day, currently as a Carver Van Allen Professor of Physics and Astronomy. He's been involved in more than 30 spacecraft projects, including Voyager 1 and 2, Galileo to Jupiter, and Cassini to Saturn. He's received numerous awards, including the John Howard Dellinger Gold Medal from the International Scienti Scientific Radio Union in 1978, the John Adams Fleming Medal from the American Geophysical Union in 1989, and the Excellence in Plasma Physics Award from the American Physical Society in 1989. In 1990, he received the M.L. Hewitt award, Faculty Award for outstanding service and dedication to students at the University of Iowa, and in 1994, the Iowa Board of Regents Award for Faculty Excellence. In 1998, Professor Gurnett was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. His talk today is entitled, Search for Water at Mars. Thank you very much for coming on such a cold evening and finding a parking place. I was beginning to wonder myself if I was going to get here, uh, mainly finding a parking place downtown. Now the uh, subject of this lecture, uh, as you can see up here, is a search for water at Mars. And if you've been watching uh, television recently or reading the news, you'll know about the Mars rovers. In almost every article, they talk about the one of the primary objectives is to look for water at Mars. Uh, now why is that? Well, uh, the basic reason is has to do with the search uh, for life in our solar system which is, has been one of the objectives of NASA since the space program started. And as we know it now, there are really only, beyond, other than the Earth, two places in our solar system where life might exist, Mars and uh, a, a moon called Europa at Jupiter, which is an even more bizarre place than Mars. At least Mars is like the Earth. It rotates about the same rate as the Earth. It's a little colder there. It's a little farther out from the sun. Uh, but so uh, life as we know it uh, requires water. Uh, NASA has other interests in water. If we ever fly humans there, of course it might be nice to, to get the water at Mars if you could uh, drill a well or something and bring it up out of the ground. And the most exotic idea that NASA had, has advanced is to use ro water as rocket fuel, which uh, may sound pretty uh, impossible. But uh, if you have electrical power, like from solar cells or from uh, a nuclear power supply, you could electrolyze water into the oxygen and hydrogen 
and uh, put in separate tanks and use that for propellant to come back from the Earth. Uh, if I were an astronaut, I don't think I'd want to count on that way of getting home, <laughs> but uh, that's the big, the big thinkers up there. Uh, so uh, I, this is a fascinating subject. Uh, Dale, do you want to get the lights out here? And, and uh, I want to go over a little bit of the history of the search for water at Mars. And uh, let me uh, start back in the 1800s, toward the latter part of the 1800s. At that time, uh, there were uh, quite good telescopes. And if you look through a telescope at Mars, you'd see a picture uh, something like this. And the things you note uh, are uh, a ice cap, a white cap, presumably ice, and uh, a lot of reddish regions. Uh, many of you probably saw Mars last uh, September and October when it was very close to the Earth and it was very kind of orange, reddish color. There are also dark regions uh, on Mars. Uh, some people would call it dark greenish. <laughs> and that remind, and also these dark areas vary with the seasons on Mars. It takes, uh, Mars goes around the sun with a uh, period of 26 months, uh, a little over two years. And during that, uh, and it have, Mars has a tilt, uh, rotational axis is tilted relative to the ecliptic, just about like the Earth is 25 degrees, Earth is uh, 23 degrees, so there are seasons at Mars. And these dark areas uh, changed with the seasons. So it was pretty natural to think that maybe it was uh, vegetation. Uh, then there's a guy by the name of Schiaparelli back in 1888. Now in those days, uh, they had cameras, but they didn't have cameras fitted to telescopes so you could take an image. So the uh, thing you would do at the time would be make a sketch of what you saw when you looked through the telescope. And uh, Schiaparelli, uh, thought he could see linear features on Mars. And he, called, he was an Italian, and he called these canali. And in Italian, canali means channel. But when this was translated in the, in the US press, it was changed to canal, which has quite a different meaning. When you use the word canal, you think of, of water. And uh, so the idea, people started thinking about these linear features as something to do with water. Then there's a guy by the name of Percival Lowell, who I think has probably had the biggest influence of anybody in history uh, on people's thinking about Mars. And he was a aristocrat, banker, uh, wealthy, and uh, he got interested in these uh, canals. And he built a telescope, uh, which is now called Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. And there's the telescope. That's a present day picture of the telescope, of the building the telescope's housed in. And here's the telescope. And he spent his life uh, at the end of the 1800s uh, looking through a telescope at Mars. And uh, he thought he saw uh, canals also. And uh, in fact, he, this is one of his drawings. In fact, he had a theory that uh, Mars, since it looked kind of reddish, was uh, undergoing a, a huge drought, essentially a desert, and that uh, intelligent beings lived there and they needed to have water, and that these were canals used to carry water down from the ice caps. And he popularized uh, uh, this basic idea of intelligent beings on Mars. He went around the country. Uh, spoke, gave popular lectures about this, and he had everybody convinced there were intelligent beings on Mars. Uh, that is the origin of the word Martians. And in fact, uh, public reaction, uh, the Wall Street Journal in 1907, I looked up this article in the Wall Street Journal, and the Wall Street Journal is right, a conservative newspaper, not uh, uh, doesn't engage in wild speculation. And they said the most important event of the year was the proof by astronomical observations that conscious, intelligent life existed on the planet Mars. Of course, that seems laughable now, but in the beginning of the century, it wasn't. And uh, then in 1938, there was a radio program by an actor, or, uh, Orson Welles, in which he 
reenacted a play over the radio, reenacted in the sense of like reporters reporting a landing of Martians in New Jersey. I'm just curious, is there anybody in the audience that heard the original radio? You did, you heard it in 1938. Is there anybody else? I usually come across people. Uh, that's great, there's I think at least three people here heard the original play. Was it, did, were you, uh, were you convinced the Martians actually were landing? Scared. scared. He said he's kind of scared. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it created widespread panic along the east coast of the United States. This just gives you an idea to the extent to which was, this was believed. Uh, in uh, 1952, my, I was 12 years old, and my parents gave me a book, a great book. I love this little book. It's very worn. You can see I spent a lot of time. And the title is The Real Book of Space Travel. The first, this is before the space age, right, 1962. And the first half of the book's about rockets and how you'd fly to the moon and things like that. The second half of the book is uh, about uh, the planets. And uh, if you just open up the section on Mars, it says there are few experts who do not agree that Mars has plant life. And here's a little sketch of something that looks like cactus growing on Mars. That's 19, 1952. I don't think I knew when I read this book that that would be the field I'd work in essentially the rest of my life. Uh, in 1957, remember Sputnik 1 was launched in 1957. So that's the start of the space era. In 1957, you can go up in our library and look this up. There was a paper published in Astrophysical Journal that studied the infrared spectrum of the dark areas on Mars. So you take an infrared spectrum and they compared it to lichen, that's supposed to be moss, not mass, <laughs> sorry about that, and dry leaves on the, on the Earth and they concluded it was an almost exact match. The existence of vegetation on Mars was regarded as virtually certain, 1957. Now to me that doesn't seem all that long ago, but I know for some of you <laughs> that's, uh, that's like ancient history. But uh, okay, so this is now the start of the space era. And uh, of course it took a while before, you know, we first there was Sputnik 1 and then the Explorer 1 and we started doing Earth orbiting spacecraft. And it took a while before we flew a spacecraft to uh, other planet. Uh, the first spacecraft flown was flown to Venus, and then finally in uh, 1964, the Mariner 4 spacecraft was launched uh, to Mars. And this was the first successful flyby of uh, Mars. And Professor Van Allen, there was an instrument built on this uh, spacecraft. Professor Van Allen had a Geiger tube on there to look for a radiation belt at Mars. And uh, I can remember vividly when this, uh, when this occurred. It flew by Mars on July 15th, 1965. And I always like to tell this little story. You know, nowadays when you have a computer and you, uh, you want to bring up a picture in your computer, you just hit enter and you get the picture just like that. Well, they didn't have computers in those days. Essentially, they didn't have computers. And uh, the way the picture was made, there was a person out at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory with a, a big white piece of paper with grid lines on it, and when the data came back, pixel by pixel, you would fill in the grid lines with a pencil. Depending on the number, it was either white or dark, and they built up the picture. And, uh, and here's the picture, the approach picture to Mars. And of course, it's, uh, you know, not a good a picture from the present uh, point of view, but it's still a historic picture, the first uh, picture taken by a spacecraft during approach to Mars. And then, we flew by Mars, and, and it, sh it really shocked the scientific world uh, what they saw. Uh, here's a mosaic of the pictures taken by Mariner 4, and the shocking thing was it looked just like the moon. Uh, craters all over the place, a completely barren landscape uh, with uh, you know, no evidence of erosion or any features like that. It looked like, and it was even stated at the time, a dead planet, like the moon. Probably an even more important experiment uh, was uh, what was called a radio occultation measurement. 
And uh, the way that worked is the spacecraft came in behind Mars, the radio signal went from the spacecraft to the Earth. And you can measure this very, very small time delay that's produced as the ray path went through the atmosphere. The atmosphere slows down the radio signal ever so slightly. And you can measure the time delay here, and there's a curve you can get from that. And from that, you can deduce the atmospheric pressure. And the atmospheric pressure was found to be about 10 times lower than people had previously guessed. In fact, the pressure is roughly at the surface 5 to 7 millibars. Uh, mil a bar is about like the atmospheric pressure. Now, the significance of that number is liquid water can't exist at that pressure. It just boils. So if you put a pan of liquid water there on Mars at that pressure, it'll just boil away. Pretty soon there'll be no water left in the pan. So the whole idea of water at Mars just was impossible. And so people had a completely new view of Mars that it was like the moon, a completely, total, totally barren place. Now that, that turned out to be kind of an unfortunate accident because in fact a lot of the planetary scientists say this is a good lesson. It turned out they flew by a part of Mars that looked like the moon but they didn't get pictures of other parts of Mars which would give you a totally different impression. In fact it took quite a while before we got pictures that, that reversed the, the sort of viewpoint about whether Mars had maybe once in the past water or not. Here's a phase diagram of water, and the three phases here are ice, down in this region down here, this is pressure and that's temperature over here, and here's the liquid region and here's the gaseous phase, vapor. Turns out the Earth, these data points here are kind of typical of the Earth, we have all three phases here at Earth. Venus, I might tell you, is way up there at 700 degrees Kelvin, very, very hot and a uh, very inhospitable place. That's why I was saying we've, we've looked around the solar system where you might have life and you just aren't going to have it at Venus or Mercury or any of those other planets. Mars is down here, well below this uh, triple point. And so you can only have gaseous and ice phase of, uh, of water present uh, at uh, Mars. At least it would appear that that's the case. Uh, now the bit, next uh, sort of historical thing is the uh, Viking 1 and 2 spacecraft, which were the first landers on Mars. Uh, this project, it actually consisted of a lander and then a, a kind of a mothership that carried the lander. And the mothership went into orbit around Mars and the lander went down and it came down on the surface. This was a great achievement. Uh, it, uh, the objective was to land on the 4th of the 200th uh, uh, anniversary of the United States on July 4th, 1976, uh, but they didn't uh, didn't carry out the landing on that date. They had to delay it because there were uh, dust storms at Mars, and they had to delay the landing. They put the thing, the spacecraft, in orbit around Mars. They delayed the landing until July 20th and August 7th, 1976. The thing that was so impressive about this, in my mind, is uh, you know it takes uh, a minimum of five minutes for the radio signal that goes from Mars to the Earth. That's if the Earth is as close as possible to Mars. And if it's as far away as possible, let's see, it's uh, 16 plus 5, 24 minutes. So the landing has to be absolutely completely automatic. And uh, I thought that was a great achievement. They used uh, parachute first, followed by rockets. Uh, ro if, you go into the, if you go to the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., there's a there's a replica of this spacecraft there, and every time I go there, I like to go over and look at the thing. Uh, uh, they used a conventional rocket to launch it, but the problem is landing. You have to use rockets to kind of re just reverse the takeoff sequence to come down and land on the surface. Uh, now, uh, Viking uh, searched for water and life at uh, Mars, found no evidence of life, microbial life. I always thought when they landed there, you know, you'd look at the camera and see a rabbit hopping around out there, but there was no such thing seen. Uh, but now, uh, the orbiter, really I think the biggest scientific contribution from Viking was the orbiter, which took a tremendous number of pictures, about 20,000 pictures in orbit. And I'll show you some of these pictures. Well, this is the lander, that's a picture from the uh, 
surface. This is actually the first picture that was taken of Mars on the surface. Uh, here's another picture I like. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the winter, because Mar Mars is farther out from the sun than the Earth, it's very cold there, and it can get down as low as uh, uh, minus 120 degrees centigrade. And at that temperature, the atmosphere is made, mostly, made up mostly of carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide precipitates in the form of snow. That's carbon dioxide snow in the, uh, in the winter, winter season. Pardon? Uh, that's a scale that I would guess is probably about 10 meters across from here to here, maybe 5 meters. Of course, you're looking over the horizon there. That's a much farther away. Uh, now, here's here. Uh, let me go over, uh, show you now some of the pictures that were taken from the orbiter. Uh, this is just a great picture. You, incidentally, you might wonder what what was Lo what were Schiaparelli and Lowell seeing when they looked at Mars and saw these uh, these canals. And you know you can see sometimes linear features, but they, they sure aren't canals. Um, a lot of people think it was just a figment of their imagination. You know, it's like looking at a cloud, and you see a face in the cloud. You look at enough clouds, pretty soon you'll see a face, and then people get fascinated with that idea, and they'll go out and look at a cloud, and they'll see a face too. That's about. That. Now there was an article in Science just a, about a year ago that I there was uh, somebody has proposed that it was actually a. Anyway, I don't know if there's any medical doctors here that could, that could explain this, because I don't know what it is, but they suggested that it was a defect in the retina of a person's, of Lowell's eye that was producing, <laughs> I, I don't know, it's a new, new theory. Uh, so there's a great picture of Mars, and you can see very clearly here uh, the northern polar cap, and you can see these dark areas, which were once thought to be vegetation, they're certainly not, and the, and the reddish areas. <coughs> Here's a picture of the northern polar cap. Uh, this is like a thousand kilometers across here. It's quite quite a big uh, polar cap, uh, and it's uh, now at the time it was thought it was made up of carbon dioxide ice, but now we have lots of good evidence that this is water ice, and uh, I'll, sh I'll show you shortly how thick it is. It's a huge glacier. Uh, lying in the northern region of Mars, and there's a similar one in the, in the southern region. Notice the interesting kind of spiral aspect here. If you take a close-up picture of some of these valleys here, I'll show you one next. Here's one where you're looking down into one of those valleys. Notice that on the side of the valley, you can see all kinds of layers here, see, like this. Uh, the general belief is that this is uh, ice and dust has been laid down layer upon layer. There's a lot of dust at Mars. Uh, there are very high winds, sometimes as high as 200 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, and, uh, and there are huge dust storms. There's a lot of dust blowing around at, uh, at Mars, and uh, uh, it looks like in the, in the polar regions, uh, these that it lays down the dust and ice in distinct layers. Now, that suggests some kind of process like we have at Earth where there are glacial ages and cycles like this. And um, it would be just great to land on Mars, just think of doing this, and drilling a ice core down through that, just like they do in Greenland. It's one of the ways you get the history of the atmosphere at Earth. And that would be a great thing to do uh, at Mars. I'll come in just a minute on how that, uh, those ice layers may be uh, laid down. Uh, here's another great picture. I like to show this one. Uh, this shows a huge canyon. It's called Valles Marineris, after the Mariner spacecraft that uh, discovered it, not Mariner 4, one of the later Mariners. Uh, that's a huge canyon, much bigger than the Grand Canyon. It's 3,000 miles from one end to the other, six miles deep at the center, and as much as 60 miles across in, in some regions here. You can also see volcanoes. Uh, those are vol uh, extinct volcanoes. There's no active volcanism at Mars, nor is there a magnetic field. The Earth has a magnetic field, which is produced by the liquid uh, molten iron core uh, of the Earth. It is believed that Mars has an iron core, but that it's, it's cooled off to the point that it's probably solid, so you don't have the conditions for making a magnetic field. That's uh, probably an important factor for life, because at Earth, 
the magnetic field of the Earth protects us from cosmic rays. It, uh, it keeps the cosmic ray flux down at the Earth. And also Mars' atmosphere is very, very thin, so any living organisms on the surface are almost directly exposed to the ultraviolet from the sun. Uh, let me show you next. This is just kind of picture show now. Uh, let me show you that uh, Valles Marineris looking down into the canyon. Uh, here's uh, you can see here's a landslide. See part of the part of the canyon slid down into the into the canyon. Now this canyon, Valles Marineris, uh, is not produced uh, by running water. Uh, it is believed that it's a rift. Uh, where the land is essentially separated, like occurs uh, near the Red Sea. There's, you know, like uh, near Jerusalem there, there's this huge uh, uh, chasm. So the, the, the current thinking is that's, uh, that's got to do with uh, 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 perhaps plate tectonics-like processes at uh, Mars, although it doesn't seem like Mars had things that really like uh, occurs at Earth. Now, let me talk next about evidence of water flow in the Viking photographs. There are many photographs that show evidence of, of uh, floods and water flows uh, on the surface of Mars. Now, these were not seen by Mariner 4. When Mariner 4 flew by, it looked like it was a dead planet without any possibility of water. But then when later pictures were taken of the other sides of Mars, uh, these things were discovered. And uh, some of the questions here are, where is the water now? Probably in polar ice caps and or permafrost. Uh, now here's a, here's a good example. Uh, here's an impact crater uh, where a meteor came in and hit the surface. And you can always tell meteor impact craters because they kind of have a high peak, somewhat of a peak right in the center of the crater. That's rather characteristic. Of the, of the reaction of the material when a meteor hits the surface. So a meteor occurred probably a long time ago, maybe several billion years ago, and uh, then there was uh, something uh, carved out this teardrop-shaped surface. And what is that something? Well, the only thing you can reasonably think of is water, some kind of fluid. But, but you, I've actually asked, how do you know it's water? <laughs> well, right now you don't for sure. But you can ask yourself, well, what else would it be? Liquid mercury? Not likely. There isn't much liquid mercury, you know, in the solar abundance. Uh, could it be alcohol? No. <laughs> so you kind of go down the list of materials that at the pressures uh, that, uh, you know, under the conditions of Mars you might have. And the only reasonable thing you can think of is water. Uh, here's another one where you can see there's a riverbed. And uh, you can see even some of these craters have kind of a... Uh, debris downstream of the, of the craters. Uh, and you, you find these in, in various areas of Mars, uh, uh, a lot of evidence of dry riverbeds. Uh, now, I'm going to shift to a more a fairly recent spacecraft. Yes. There, there's, a, there's a lot of evidence. The question was, could winds have produced uh, this effect? Uh, there's a lot of evidence of, that you can see in the pictures, uh, sand dunes. They're, they're very, very common there. And, uh, and they, the sand dunes have certain characteristic features, but they don't look like that, nor do they on Earth. Uh, there's things called uh, yardangs, which are produced by wind, characteristic shape. Uh, and they look just like they do at Earth, but there's nothing no way we know of that wind can produce that kind of a that kind of a feature, that teardrop shape around an obstacle. That's just character. Now here's a little spacecraft that really produced remarkable results. It's called Mars Global Surveyor. It was launched in September 1997. That's what uh, six years ago, seven years ago. Uh, now uh, the main instrument on Mars Global Surveyor, it had a camera. But it also had an, a laser altimeter, which was actually a little telescope looking straight down. And what it would do, it would send out a laser pulse. It sent out a very short pulse going straight down. That uh, light would reflect off the surface and come back. And by measuring the time delay, you could measure the distance uh, to the surface very accurately to about a meter. 
And uh, this spacecraft was put in a circular orbit. Uh, they had to go to a lot of trouble to do that. They had to use atmospheric drag to circularize the orbit and get a nice circular orbit. And so knowing the orbit and knowing the time delay every time that laser pulse went down to the surface, you can make a map of Mars, a topological map. Now up to this point, we had pictures of Mars, but uh, it's very difficult from pictures to actually get the, the elevation of the surface. Uh, there's been lots of attempts at that with photographs. One technique is to use uh, stereoscopic imaging. Here's what you do. The spacecraft's going along, you take a picture this way, and then the spacecraft moves, and you take a picture back like this, and you try and triangulate. But that's just really difficult to get good accuracy. So really, people at this point did not know the topology of Mars, where are the high elevations and where are the low elevations. And uh, OK, I'll show you first. Here's a map of uh, the northern polar cap. I, I showed that earlier. And uh, that's now known to be water ice. And for the first time, you could get an elevation map here. Now, blue is the lowest elevation and red is the highest. I know you probably can't read that there, but the scale from blue to red is about six kilometers. And so this ice cap is, well, let's see, actually white is the highest. Uh, to the red is about four kilometers. That ice cap is about four kilometers thick. That's about, uh, what, three, a little less than three miles. Now, you know that the uh, uh, northern hemisphere was covered with ice during the last glacial age to a depth of a couple miles, two to three miles. So over the uh, northern polar cap of Mars, uh, you have a huge storage of uh, water ice uh, with a thickness on the order of you know, a couple miles, to, uh, two or three miles thick. Uh, and same thing down at the South Pole. Now, the South Pole polar cap is, uh, is a little more complicated. There's believed to be, a, uh, okay, let me tell you about, a little more about the ice situation at the two polar caps. Um, there's also carbon dioxide ice. Uh, every winter, the northern hemisphere gets covered with carbon dioxide snow or ice. And, but then when summer comes, that evaporates. So you really have two kinds of ice uh, occurring at, at Mars. You have a, th a relatively thin layer of carbon dioxide ice that's less than a meter thick, tens of centimeters, and then this huge thick layer of water ice. Uh, now, uh, the southern polar cap, it turns out it's colder at the southern polar cap. And I'll, uh, I'll uh, explain that in just a minute. That's kind of an orbital issue. And it is believed there's a lot more carbon dioxide that's uh, there permanently in the southern polar cap. Uh, it's really somewhat unknown how much water and how much carbon dioxide. There's a permanent carbon dioxide uh, covering in the southern uh, polar cap. Okay, so there's a, a global surveyor gave us a measurement of, of the thickness of the ice layer at the two poles. But here's the greatest achievement. This is a map. Uh, this is latitude, here's the equator, and this is longitude around Mars. And uh, the blue is the lowest elevation. It's, it's, uh, of course, at Earth we would measure elevation relative to sea level, but there is no sea level there. So they, they set an arbitrary, uh, they call it geopotential height. It's actually at Mars, I'm not sure what they call it. It's, I think of it as like geopotential height. And that's arbitrarily set at zero, then you measure elevation relative to that. Now, what you can see here is uh, the northern and southern, this is the northern hemisphere, this is the southern hemisphere. The northern and southern hemispheres are quite different. The, the southern hemisphere is much higher elevation terrain and it's just heavily cratered. The uh, northern hemisphere, on the other hand, is very smooth and that had been noted from the Mariner and Viking photographs that the northern hemisphere is very, very smooth. And nobody really knew uh, for sure why that was. In fact, I think you could, might be able to say that to the present day. But uh, you'll also notice there are very few meteor craters up here. And so the idea was born, uh, in fact, there was an article about three years ago in the New York Times that Mars once had a huge ocean and that this is the sediment from the ocean. 
And there are powerful arguments for that. One of them is, if you look at the, if you look at the edge of this reputed ocean, you know, like along in here, uh, you can make the following map, and you can see things that are called terraces. See, like running right along here, there's a kind of a cutout in the land level, all at the same height. Now, terraces like that at Earth are formed at the edge of oceans by water waves. In fact, the classic example of that, if you ever go out to uh, Los Angeles, uh, along Santa Monica there, there's a, there's a cliff that suddenly drops off about, uh, I don't know, about 100 feet or so. And that's uh, formed by uh, ocean waves coming in, eroding the, eroding the uh, cliff there. And the punchline is that these uh, terraces are at the same elevation in different places around Mars. So you're left with the question, how could you ever do that without having an ocean there somehow to get the same level? Uh, now, I'll invite you afterwards if you want to come up. This, this uh, photograph, uh, this uh, map I have back here, uh, this picture you're seeing on the screen just doesn't do justice to that. Uh, I have a much higher resolution picture over here, which you can come over and look at afterwards, but it just has incredible resolution. I mean, you can almost take a microscope up there or a magnifying glass up there and look at details. And if you, if you do that, it's not so apparent here, but this area right here appears to be a delta. In fact, uh, if you look on the high resolution thing, you can see there's like streams coming out there. You know, like at the base of the Mississippi River, where water flows out into the Gulf of Mexico, it looks like it was carrying sediment out into this uh, region. Pro this is Valles Marineris here. That's that canyon I showed you. And it was water apparently was flowing out uh, like this. Uh, here's some of these big, uh, that, that's Olympus Mons. I didn't show you that. That's the highest volcano in, uh, in, in existence. I think it's three times as high as Mount Everest. Now, so, a revolution in people's thinking. Uh, it appears that, at least according to argument three years ago, that Mars once had a huge ocean in the northern hemisphere. If it had an ocean, uh, the argument goes, it must have had a higher atmospheric pressure because you can't maintain water at the present pressure. So the thinking is that there was a time in the past when Mars had a higher atmospheric pressure and since it's mostly carbon dioxide, there might have been a greenhouse effect and so you have a higher temperature, maybe even an Earth-like temperature. Now, there have, however, been strong arguments to the contrary. And this is the situation we're in right now, about what, what is going on, what was going on in the, at, at Mars in the past. Um, here are some of the arguments against an, uh, an ocean. Um, they've looked for uh, carbonates, like limestone. Uh, that has a characteristic infrared signature you can look for, and they don't find any. All right? They don't find very much, anyway. And uh, the way, uh, way that's formed at Earth is uh, carbon dioxide dissolves in water and then it precipitates out in the form of limestone. That's one way you can produce uh, uh, limestone. Uh, however, that, that there have been scientists who have, have, uh, have papers you can read that confidently say, well, there was never a lot of water there because we don't find enough carbonates. Well. Uh, I don't know if you've been following the news, I probably have, uh, when uh, Spirit landed on what they thought was a dry lake bed. Turned out it wasn't a lake bed, it was a lava flow. <laughs> so this whole business of trying to deduce what's down there from pictures is a real black art. Until you land and actually take samples, uh, I think it's really hard to say. Um, now, another Another argument about this ocean is, well, maybe it, maybe it was just a transient effect that, uh, here's the kind of thinking, oh, I forgot, there's one more point. How about all these meteor craters around here? If there was once a huge ocean and a lot of water in the atmosphere, there should have been erosion. You know, if it was raining, it would wipe, like on Earth, you can't hardly find meteor craters because they're wiped out of, uh, by erosion. So almost certainly, there was not a period uh, with a lot of rain all over the planet. I, I think you could probably say that's a, a true statement. 
incidentally, these meteor craters are more or less consistent with the meteor cratering rate on the moon. And on the moon, we know that, that was, uh, those craters were formed during a period of heavy bombardment about four billion years ago. <laughs> Just let that settle in your mind. That terrain may be four billion years old and not really significantly modified uh, since then. So people have been scratching their head saying, well, how could this look like an ocean? Might have been an ocean up here. Well, one idea that's been advanced is, uh, well, yes, there's a lot of water at Mars, but maybe it's in permafrost, and maybe there was a big impact uh, with Mars sometime in the distant past that, that, or, or, or a volcanic episode that melted a lot of the permafrost, led to flooding of this uh, area up here. Uh, which eventually, on a fairly short time scale, dissipate. Uh, it's just a, it's just a big puzzle right now. So okay, now here's one of the more recent things from uh, Global Surveyor. They started looking at really high resolution pictures of craters, and they, they saw these gullies down the sides of craters. And now some of these craters are probably relatively recent, meaning less than a billion years. <laughs> I mean, we have to start thinking. That's one of the big problems we have. We don't know the time scales on which we're talking about here with uh, good accuracy. Uh, most people think that this is a fairly recent effect, put recent 100,000 years maybe. And uh, it looks like uh, water has been running down the sides of these craters. In fact, down here at the bottom, you can see a kind of a debris field. And this debris field seems to be overlaying older terrain. Uh, so how does, this, how does this happen? You can look in the astronomy textbooks and you can find about four or five different models. <laughs> like some people argue this wasn't water. It was carbon dioxide <laughs> in the ground. And somehow it got melted up enough and it got into a liquid phase which came out and uh, now, the carbon dioxide should not be a liquid here for any reasonable length of time. It should either be a solid or a gas. So there's, there's a theory that has to do, this was produced by carbon dioxide. Um, now, let's show you another picture. Here's a, here's a picture. There's a guy by the name of Phil Christensen has come up with this side. Here's a meteor crater. And uh, let's see, I think you can see these kind of gullies on this side. Incidentally, here's another interesting thing about this. These gullies are always on the poleward facing side of the crater, not, not the equator. You know, you might think that the way, uh, the, the way you might produce water there, if, like, if there's water in permafrost, that it would be the sun, the side facing toward the sun. That would be the uh, equator word facing uh, side of the crater, because that would be warmed up by sunlight. But no, these gullies are on the other side. Just, just an interesting puzzle. Now this picture shows some terrain up here that they call pasted on the side, some kind of material, isn't a very good picture actually, but pasted on the side of the crater. The latest idea, which a guy by the name of Phil Christensen has advanced, is that these are snow banks covered by dust. So when you look at it, it looks like dirt, but actually there's snow under there. And that that snow, uh, at some time or other, got warmed up enough that it began to melt, and under this snowpack, you get water producing these gullies. That's, that's kind of the, the latest thinking on that. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, seasons and climate on Mars. Uh, the rotational axis of Mars is tilted at a substantial angle, 25 degrees, very kind of similar to the Earth. Earth is 23 degrees. Uh, I don't know if that telephone calls for me or not, but uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the rotational axis is tilted here, just like, like the Earth, but there's a, there's a significant difference between the Earth's orbit and Mars orbit. Mars orbit is quite eccentric. That is, on this side, it goes out farther from the sun than it does on this side. See, it's farther out here than here. So uh, let's take a look at the, uh, of course, the farther you go away from the sun, the lower the light intensity from the sun, so you won't get as much heating. 
So if you're in the southern hemisphere here, uh, you'll be farther from the sun, but then the, again the uh, sunlight be shining, uh, shining directly on your on the polar cap there. So you'll have a, a that's summer right here, but it'll be a fairly moderate summer. On the other hand, if you go up to the North Pole, uh, now you're as far apart as, uh, away from the sun as, as you'll ever be, and not only that, the sun's not shining on the polar cap, so you'll have a very cold winter. And then it kind of reverses over on the other side, you'll have a moderate winter here and a very hot summer. Now there's a number of things in play here. The rotational axis uh, uh, of, of Mars precesses. It goes around like this with a period of 51,000 years. Uh, the Earth's rotational axis also precesses and goodness, I hope I remember the number. If there's anybody, 26,000 years I think, isn't that right for the Earth? Pretty sure that's the right number. Uh, so Mars uh, precesses also. Uh, now, uh, another thing happens. It is now believed that the tilt currently 25 degrees of the rotational axis uh, is perturbed by the orbit by Jupiter. Uh, Mars is closer to Jupiter than the Earth is and it is believed that on about a million year time scale, uh, sorry, uh, I'm trying to keep my time scales right here, uh, on about a hundred thousand year time scale that tilt may go up as high as 60 degrees. So if it gets to 60 degrees you'll have a period like over here, if that tilt angle gets up to 60 degrees, then you got the sun really shining right on the polar cap, and then the polar cap will be warmer than the equator. And if that, if that happens in the phase of the precession, uh, where the, uh, the northern uh, rotational axis is pointing at the sun, you'll have a very hot summer. So here's the kind of thinking that there's this, uh, there's this, oh, uh, one more thing, let's see, uh, uh, there's a million year period. Yeah, the eccentricity of the orbit is believed to have about a million year periodicity in the eccentricity. So you combine all these things together and there may be periods on the order of, you know, over like a million years where the northern polar caps gets, gets significantly warmer and melts the ice in the polar ice cap. That's, that's the thinking. Now, you may, uh, you may recognize the uh, connection here with uh, glacial periods on the Earth. There's a thing called the Milankovitch cycle. The Earth's orbit isn't quite as eccentric, but the same kinds of things go on with the Earth's orbit, and that's probably, a, it is believed by the scientists that study that, not me, uh, that uh, it's those kind of things that uh, affect the long-term climate and things like glacial ages. One would say, that Mars is now like, uh, locked in an ice age, but that may not have been the case for you know all time, going back on a time scale of a million years. Let's talk a little more about evidence of subsurface water. Here's a great experiment. A uh, good friend of mine, Bill uh, Feldman, and one of my former students, Bob Tokar, uh, carried this experiment out on the Mars Odyssey spacecraft. And what they're doing, they're looking for water, <coughs> subsurface water. And here's how it works. Uh, the planet is continually bombarded by cosmic rays, just like we are. If you set a Geiger tube out here, it'll sit there and click. So cosmic rays come in and hit the surface. The atmosphere is very thin, so the, it, it, uh, the uh, atmosphere hardly affects the cosmic rays. Cosmic ray comes in, uh, hits a nucleus of a material in the surface, you know, like silicon, for example. And when it does that, a reaction occurs, a nuclear reaction occurs that emits a neutron or several neutrons. Now, these neutrons then come flying out and they, if they hit another atom, they bounce around in the surface, but uh, uh, some of them will escape through the surface. Okay, so you can measure then the neutron flux coming up out of the surface, and they have a neutron detector up here in the spacecraft. Now, if there's hydrogen present, hydrogen has a mass that's almost exactly the same as a neutron. And if a neutron hits a hydrogen atom, uh, it's like two billiard balls hitting each other, it'll transfer the momentum to the hydrogen atom, and effectively it absorbs the neutron. So if there's uh, neutrons, if there's a hydrogen present, some of the neutrons are essentially absorbed by the hydrogen. 
so you won't have as much neutron flux coming out. So by measuring the neutron flux, you can tell whether there's hydrogen in the surface. Well, hydrogen, uh, you don't find much hydrogen in just materials, like, like rock, for example. Where you find hydrogen is with water, H2O. So this is then interpreted as a measurement of water, the presence of water. And they made, uh, very recently, 2001, just, this is just uh, three years ago, uh, they made this map of Mars. And uh, the, the kind of purple and blue regions are water-rich uh, material. Now these cosmic rays just pen penetrate a few tens of centimeters into the, into the surface. So you're, you're measuring the water concentration in, in at most, the top meter. And uh, you'll notice there's a tremendous amount of water here in the surface. In fact, they estimate these regions above about 50 or 60 degrees of latitude in the material, 50% water. So there's a, this, this is now evidence of a tremendous amount of water in the subsurface material. Not liquid water because the temperature is probably permafrost. Even near the equator, there's uh, significant levels of water uh, ice. Uh, now, let me now discuss the project we're currently working on. Uh, this is an artist sketch of the Mars Express spacecraft. This is a European Space Agency uh, uh, project. And uh, myself and uh, uh, a group at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and another uh, person at the uh, University of Rome, we proposed about, I guess it was about five or six years ago, to fly a radar on Mars Express to look for subsurface water. It's a very special kind of radar. Um, what we want to do is penetrate deep into the surface, and to do that you have to operate at very low radar frequencies. You know, <coughs> most radars, like the one up at the Cedar Rapids Airport where they, uh, they keep track of airplanes, they operate on wavelengths of a few centimeters. Your police radar, I don't actually know what a police radar operates at, but they're very short wavelengths also, you know, a few centimeters. This radar operates with wavelengths of several hundred meters. And to transmit such a radio wave, the, the important point is, if you want to penetrate deep into the surface, there's kind of a, a, a principle of electricity and magnetism. You want to go to as low a frequency as possible. It increases this, the, what we call the skin depth. Uh, so, uh, and in order to transmit at such low frequencies, you need a really big antenna. And that's an antenna we provided. It's 160 feet uh, tip to tip. And there's also a monopole antenna uh, right here. Uh, let me show you now. Th this was a very difficult project that we succeeded in building. Here's the radar transmitter. And uh, I don't know, is Don Kirshner here? Don, why don't you stand up? I want to have you, everybody know you. Because he's the guy that made this thing work. And uh, I'll try to explain how difficult it is. Uh, to send out the radar pulse, we have to put a thousand volts on that antenna. You see, you want to radiate as much power as you can. We'd have gone higher, but we were afraid that it would arc. I mean, there's a limit to how much voltage you can put on an antenna. And the problem is that uh, when you put the radar pulse on the antenna, uh, the electronics likes to ring. And uh, so you put on a 91 microsecond pulse at, let's say, one megahertz frequency, and then you turn the, turn the transmitter off, and then 50 microseconds later, you got to be ready to hear this return echo coming back up from the ground. And that echo is down at about a tenth of a microvolt. That's 10 to the minus 6. That's 10 to the ninth smaller than the signal you put on the antenna. And that is a very difficult engineering project. Also, uh, designing the thing so that it would radiate efficiently was uh, also a very difficult matter because you had to have an impedance matching network. I have uh, sometimes uh, compared this to hitting the Liberty Bell with a sledgehammer. That makes it ring. And then one millisecond later, you got to hear a, a pin drop. You see with the analogy? <laughs> That's the technically difficult uh, aspect of this. Uh, now, this... Uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, instrument, with this spacecraft, here's a picture of the spacecraft, and there's Don. I should ask some of my other team here also. Willie Robeson was helped with the antenna, and Bob Johnson, where is Bob? I don't know if he's here someplace. Now, who else have I left off? Uh, let's see, <laughs> I gotta remember, Rich Huff's not here. He's, uh, he was a project manager. He's actually over in Italy now, planning some of the operations for us. He's gone this week. Um, okay, now, uh, uh, here's a picture of the spacecraft, uh, and uh, this is our antenna system. It's, uh, I'll show you a little bit how it works. It's a new type of antenna we're using. Remember, this thing is, uh, uh, let's see, 60, 60 feet long. And the way it's made, it's a fiberglass, and it has a cutout here, and you see there's just kind of a little hole there. It's, it's fiberglass and Kevlar. It's a combination of the two. And if you bend this thing, it'll collapse like that, see? So that's a hinge. And uh, so it's 20 meters and there's one meter section. So you fold all those 20 sections up like this and then you stuff it in a box. And you put an explosive bolt on the lid and you fire the bolt cutter and the lid opens and this thing pops out like that. Now, so that you'll have a real demonstration here in how this works. We actually have a mock-up of this. See up there in the ceiling that white board? Well, the antenna is behind it, and uh, we have not extended the antenna yet. They're still adjusting the orbit, getting the orbit in the right place, and in April, we will extend this antenna. And I'm told by my engineering crew here that if I pull this string, <laughs> <laughs> it will make the antenna come down. <laughs> and see, that is, that is a short version of our antenna. Uh, the real one is about 60 feet long and another one going out 60 feet in the opposite direction. And of course, uh, fiberglass and Kevlar, you probably realize, is not a good conductor, so we have a wire in there actually inside for the antenna. So. Uh, How's it going to work? Uh, yeah, if you want to put the lights out. Here's, uh, here's what we're going to try and do. Uh, the surface, we believe, is permafrost. There's now lots of evidence that there's wa water ice in the surface. Now, uh, as you go down into the planet, because of radioactive heating, the temperature will increase as you go into the planet. That's also true at the Earth. There's radioactive material in the, in the, in the ground in the core of the earth and that produces heat. Uh, at the earth, if you go down in a mine, I was in Sweden a few years ago and I went down in a mine that I believe was a thousand feet deep and it's very hot down there. The temperature goes up about three degrees centigrade every hundred meters. So as you go into the surface, you should get to a depth. See, it's, freeze, it's below freezing at the surface. Typical temperature at Mars, by the way, is about uh, minus 60 Fahrenheit. It's really cold. But as you go, uh, of course, at the equator, on a nice summer day at the equator, you can just get up to freezing. So a uh, nice summer day. By the time you get up to the poles, it's minus 200. So a uh, big temperature gradient from the equator to the poles. Uh, but the idea is, as you go down into the planet, you finally should get to the point where the temperature gets to zero degrees centigrade, and then that ice should turn to water. So you'll have an ice-water interface. Now water is very uh, reflective at radar frequencies. It has a very high dielectric constant. So what uh, we hope can, we can do is we send out the radar pulse, we'll get a reflection from the surface. The, the radar signal is called a ground penetrating radar. will continue to go down into the surface material. When it reaches the water layer, we'll get a reflection. And of course, as we go from, the, say, the North Pole to the equator here, we should see that level. Uh, this is an ideal theorist slide. I suspect it'll be not quite as uh, simple as this, but this is the idea. As you go to the equator, that, uh, that uh, depth of that interface should start coming up, maybe come all the way up to the surface. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to look for that. That's the, uh, that's the basic scientific content of our experiment. I might tell you, you might wonder if this has ever been done. The answer is uh, yes, it's been done down the Antarctic. And they flow in airplanes over the Antarctic, uh, sending radar signals down through the ice. In fact, they discovered a lake under the 
glacier in the Antarctic. It's called Lake Vostok, and that's how it was discovered by a, a radar that penetrates down through the uh, down through the ice. You generally can't do this at any normal latitude at the Earth because there's there's too much water in the ground and there's salts in the ground that make the ground conductive and uh, a ground penetrating radar doesn't work very good at Earth, but we think it'll work well at, uh, at Mars. Uh, this whole ground penetrating radar is kind of a new business. I, I did read a few years ago they tried to find some uh, tombs in a pyramid with this technique and I believe they didn't succeed. Some of you may have heard of the story of uh, uh, recovering some uh, well, P-38 World War II fighters that landed on the ice cap in Greenland. And uh, that was way back in 1942 or something like that. And of course, it snows a lot in Greenland. In the intervening 50 years or more, uh, those airplanes were buried under 300 feet of snow and uh, completely lost. They didn't know where they were. And they used one of these kind of radars to locate them. And uh, one of them was recovered, brought up from 300 feet from under the ice, and was flown last October. And Mike Wilson, where are you? Mike helped restore that airplane. Why don't you put your hand up, Mike? He went down to Tennessee. He used to fly those airplanes, actually. <laughs> uh, OK, now here's where we are now. The spacecraft is in kind of an elliptical orbit like that, and they've been adjusting the orbit. Uh, and. Uh, uh, in April, when we extend the antenna, we're going to be going over the southern polar cap. That's our first target, is to study the ice down at the southern polar cap. And then over a period of time, this orbit will evolve. The, the, this high point will gradually precess around, and uh, where we operate the radar just over this arc right here. So they store the data, and then they transmit the data back to the Earth during this part of the orbit. That's the basic operational scheme. Uh, let's see, does anybody here help me with a period? I can't remember. I think it's about six hours or so. I think there's three orbits a day. Does that work? <laughs> no, that wouldn't be quite right. Eight hours. Uh, it's about that. Uh, I'm going to change the subject just a little bit, just to close this uh, discussion. <laughs> you have probably read in the newspapers about uh, President Bush's uh, uh, newly stated objective to fly a human to Mars. Now, actually, this was, uh, this was first suggested by uh, the first President Bush, Bush the first, on July 21st, 1989. But it didn't, it didn't really stick uh, because uh, time went by and nothing happened. But this time, uh, it may be, in fact, they're reorganizing NASA headquarters right, right now. There, there's major reorganizations taking place at NASA headquarters to actually uh, trying to do this, and it's an interesting political issue of whether or not Congress will provide the money. They've, uh, I just read in the paper today that they've given NASA, uh, President Bush has proposed NASA get a 5.6% uh, increase. So I'm going to talk just a few things about sending humans to Mars, just to kind of close this off. This is a very difficult proposition. Uh, the first uh, point, the one that almost everybody that reads about this recognizes, is the extremely high cost. Uh, when uh, President Bush the first proposed it back in 89, the cost estimate was $400 billion. That would be at least a couple Iraq wars, I would imagine, or something like that in terms of cost. Now, let's, let's talk about the flight time. Uh, the flight time is very long, about three years. I'll, I'll get into that. I'll show you that. Uh, another problem is unless you go to some very special techniques, you're going to have to deal with zero gravity on he for humans. The flight time to Mars, to get to Mars, is about seven-tenths of a year. And the experience, uh, the Russians have a lot more experience with long space flight than we have. And some of their cosmonauts, after nine months, have been basically bedridden when they were taken out of their spaceship. Uh, so they're, they're, that varies a lot from individual to individual, but uh, serious problem. Uh, also, you get exposed directly to very energetic cosmic rays with heavy ions. And uh, it is, uh, you don't read much about this in the paper, but I, I, knew, I heard people discuss this issue as much as 15 years ago or so. 
that uh, if you have a flight, time, flight to Mars, you get your lifetime limit of uh, radiation dose from cosmic rays. In other words, you wouldn't want any more. But apparently it's uh, survivable from the point of view of uh, cosmic rays. However, there's another factor, solar flares. You may remember last October, October 28th and November 4th, there were two huge solar flares. Uh, solar flares put out very energetic protons when a flare occurs, and uh, they would be lethal, absolutely lethal. You'd be toast if a uh, solar flare like we had in October or uh, November occurred. That was a risk, by the way, that the Apollo astronauts took on their flight to the moon. Uh, I, there's, a, there's a solar cycle, there's a solar minimum and a solar maximum. It takes 11 years. And I honestly look, tried to look this up one day. Does anybody here know when they flew the Apollo missions? I don't think it was during solar maximum, but it wasn't solar minimum either. I mean, it was a, it was a risk. But of course, they had a short flight time. I think about two to three days to get to the moon. They were there a few days, and then they came back. So their exposure was not, you know, their probability was not that high, and nothing like that happened. Can the flight time be cut down? I'll show you the flight time issue right now. Let's talk about how you get to Mars. Right now, the only way you can fly from one planet to another is to use what we call a minimum energy trajectory. Uh, that's uh, uh, called a Holman transfer ellipse. And the way it works, there, we just don't have rockets that have the capability of getting you there at any arbitrary time. In fact, uh, really the only possibility is fly uh, uh, on a, a trajectory like I'm going to discuss. And the way you do it, here's the Earth going around in its orbit. It takes one year to go around. Mars takes uh, a little over two years to go around its orbit. So to get to Mars, here's how you do it. You wait till Mars gets in this relative position uh, relative to the Earth. So you fire your rocket here, and you get yourself on an elliptical trajectory that comes over here and intersects Mars at just the time it takes Mars to arrive at this point. This is an elementary uh, astronomy. Maybe some of the uh, students here have actually worked this problem. It's a pretty straightforward problem to work. And uh, uh, it takes seven-tenths of a year to go from here to here. So the flight time is seven-tenths of a year. You might say not too bad, but let's suppose you arrive at Mars after your seven-tenths of a year flight, and let's say you've gotten homesick, or you're just plain tired of this exercise, and you say, I want to go home. Well, you can't. <laughs> and here's why. Because if you want to go home, the Earth is over there, and that's not in the proper position for you to affect a rendezvous with, uh, with the Earth. If you had not take, uh, taken introductory astronomy and didn't know about this, and you said, okay, we'll just fly by Mars, and we'll get back to the Earth. Well, you get back all right. You come back in this trajectory here, and you intersect the Earth's orbit okay, but the Earth isn't there. That's the problem. So what you have to do is this. You arrive at Mars here, and Mars continues to go around the sun, and so does the Earth. And you finally have to wait until Mars gets to this position right here, and the Earth is there. You notice the geometry is very similar to the launch. And then if you launch from Mars, you can come back and intersect and actually rendezvous with the Earth here seven-tenths of a year later. It takes 1.42 years to go all the way around here. So you have seven-tenths of a year to get to Mars, then you got to stay there for 1.4, and then you got another 0.7 to come home. So that's uh, roughly 2.8 years. Now it is true that you can cut down the flight time a little bit, but not much, from this minimum energy trajectory. It's just not not possible with our current uh, rocket technology. So, I don't know how many of you saw the, the movie Mission to Mars, uh, but maybe someday uh, we'll be doing this. I think it's going to be an interesting uh, 
political exercise here in the next few months to see what happens <laughs> to this uh, Mars uh, project. I uh, personally, uh, without thinking about the money, <laughs> would say that it was a great thing to do. I mean, I'd like to see them fly humans to Mars and land on the polar cap up there and bring along an ice coring machine and drill an ice core down there and pull that ice core out and study the long-term climate history of Mars. That would be a, that would be a great thing. Uh, but, uh, but there gets to be the cost issue. And uh, let me finish it by saying that the problem for NASA, I think, is really not uh, exactly going to Mars. Their real problem is what to do with the human spaceflight program. That's the problem. Because what we have now is the shuttle ferrying, when it works, astronauts up to the space station, and the space station has almost no known purpose right now. And it would appear that President Bush has recognized this because he's going to terminate the shuttle flights in, I think, 2010, if I remember right from what I read in the paper, and he's going to give the space station away to the Russians. And the real problem was that when the space station uh, project was envisioned, there was not a good defendable goal. Uh, when I say goal, you know, like if, if you're, I, actually, Bush's uh, logic and his administration has a certain amount of sense to it if your objective is to go to Mars. You can ask the question, what could you do with humans in space? And really there aren't very many good answers to that. Where can you go? I like to ask, ask people, where would you want to go? You're sure not going to go to Venus. Above the melting point of lead at Venus, Mercury's worse. Uh, Mars is kind of like the Earth, so it might make sense. How about Jupiter? Anybody want to go to Jupiter? No, Jupiter has a radiation belt that is incredibly intense. It's all we can do to build a spacecraft to survive a flight through the radiation belt at uh, Jupiter. Now, <laughs> there is this moon, Europa, at Jupiter that we think, good evidence actually, that it has a ice layer, and underneath the ice there's a water ocean. But Europa is right in the middle of the radiation belt at Jupiter. <laughs> uh, not a very pleasant place to go. And you look at the other planets, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, no, no way. So uh, I think NASA has faced right, has been faced for quite a while since the Apollo landings actually, uh, with the problem of having a vision of what to do with human, human spaceflight. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> right. Yes. What speed do you get up to? Uh, you know, I didn't come. He asked, what speed do you have to uh, get up to in order to fly to Mars? And I didn't bring that with me in my head. I think the launch velocity at Earth has to be about, about three kilometers per second to escape from the Earth to get to Mars. First, you have to get away from the Earth, and that takes 11 kilometers per second. So it's up around 14, I think. There was another question, right, somewhere here. Oh, okay, yes. Okay, your question was? Well, I thought that you could just fly to the orbit and then eventually Earth would come around again. Uh, well, that's sort of true, actually. But you have to, t he said uh, that you have to uh, wait for the Earth to come around, and that's, that's true. Uh, but you have to time things right so that when the spacecraft gets there, the Earth's there. And if you don't have that timing right, you won't rendezvous. Um, I don't know if I understood your question exactly, but uh, did you understand my answer? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes? Um, given current technology, can you envision any science on Mars that can't be done in the 
Uh, it's hard to think of it if you want to put enough uh, effort into it. And you know, uh, robotic missions are probably one-tenth the cost of a human mission, maybe even less than that. I mean, I spent my whole life doing robotic missions. Uh, yes, okay, I'll repeat the question. Can I think of anything that you could do with a human that uh, could not be done with a robot? Okay, I'll, I'll, I think of one thing. Uh, when a human, when Neil Armstrong landed on the, mu on the moon, we can say that we landed on the moon, meaning a human. And you can't do that with a robot. And I think that's the I think that's the gut thing that is driving flying humans to Mars. I really believe if you, if you sweep that away, you could do uh, most things with robotic uh, spacecraft. I will tell you, however, there are some huge problems. Uh, one of them is the light travel time from Earth to, uh, to Mars. If you send a radio signal, well, as I said, it, the shortest it can ever be is five minutes. Let's take the shortest it could ever be. Okay, that's five minutes one way, five minutes back. So it's a 10, 10 minute round trip, uh, uh, we call it light time. Can you imagine driving your car out on the street with a 10 minute time delay between where you turn the steering wheel and uh, the car actually responds? That's the problem they basically have with the rover. They have to plan every move very carefully and then send the command and let it do it you know, over that period of time. That, that is a real impediment, uh, but, you know, if you got time, you can, uh, you can do it. Okay. How about sample return? sample return? That is going to be one of the next things on the agenda. Uh, I would guess that uh, this new initiative of sending humans to the moon and to Mars is probably going to lead to a lot more robotic missions in the, in the near future. I've already had a discussion with some people at Jet Propulsion Laboratory last week about that. I believe there'll be a significant growth in, uh, in doing these robotic missions, uh, not only to Mars, but also to the moon. Uh, because uh, I, I don't personally buy the moon a uh, bit. We've been there, done that. Uh, we've learned, I think, a very substantial amount of the scientific things that can be learned from the moon. I'm sure you can come up with more things. But uh, the, the claim uh, in this new proposal is to use the moon as kind of a testing ground for, uh, and there might be some truth to that, but it is not, uh, maybe you read the piece in the New York Times, there's a real good piece in the New York Times today about this. They're, they're talking about using the moon as a waypoint to Mars. That sounds nice if you're driving down Interstate 80 and you want to get a hamburger someplace, but Really, it's not the way to do it because the moon has gravity and you have to expend a lot of energy to land there first and then you have to expend the energy to get away. The best way to go to Mars would be Mars direct. <laughs> <laughs> Launch from Earth and go there. <laughs> My pilot friends know what I mean when I say direct. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, this, the moon aspect of it, I, I don't know. It, it seems to me they, I've talked to a number of people about this Mars Direct. That's the way to. That's the way to do it. There's a great article in the New York Times today about all this. They talk about the space station as, you, as being used as a waypoint, and the people that decided this a number of years ago uh, didn't get briefed on orbital mechanics <laughs> because the orbit of the space station is inclined at 51 degrees, and that was to accommodate the Russians because their launch facility at Baikonur is up there at a very high latitude and for the Russians to be able to get their rockets to rendezvous at the space station you have to have the orbit inclined at 51 degrees. Here's the problem if you use it as a way station you, you, you have to be shooting at something up out of the ecliptic plane. It doesn't work for anything you want to fly to. Uh, that's just a fact. The, spa the space station is not usable as a waypoint to anything. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. uh, the question is, could there be any bacteria or living things at Mars? Uh, well, uh, Viking 1 and 2 had an instrument on there to search for life. They found nothing. But I think most of my colleagues would say that was not conclusive because, you know, maybe you didn't look in the right place. You need to look someplace where there's maybe liquid water. Uh, 
That's the great question. Is there life anyplace else in this universe other than here on Earth? And I'll tell you, I think that's one of the greatest achievements of, this, of, the, of the United States space program, you might say the Russians, is back there and when, I had, when I read this book, we thought life, you know, Venus, our sister planet, right? It's covered with clouds, you know, a little closer to the sun, a little warmer, might maybe like Florida or, <laughs> or, or uh, Brazil, you know? Instead, it turns out to be just tr tremendously different than the Earth. Dense carbon dioxide atmosphere with a, a temperature above the melting point of lead. And we've looked all over the solar system. Like, for example, when we flew Voyager by uh, Saturn, the prime targeting objective, Carl Sagan was the guy that pushed this, was to make a close flyby of the moon Titan. And the reason is that Titan has a dense atmosphere and it might have a greenhouse effect. Well, we got there and we found out the temperature is 90 degrees Kelvin. I forget what that is in Fahrenheit. I think it's minus 260 or something like that, Fahrenheit. So, you know, we've looked all over the solar system and really life is uh, very precious. It's right here at Earth and maybe possibly at Mars or you got to, you know, there's these people that think Europa under that ice at uh, Europa might be a possibility. You know, under the ice at Europa, what are you going to find under there? Sharks? No. Uh, but the thinking is there might be some of these uh, uh, thermal vents. I was going to call them geothermal vents, but you wouldn't call that Europa, I guess, but uh, where there's uh, life living off of sulfur or something of that type. That might be. Okay. I have a uh, is it simply cold that prohibits you from landing directly on the ice cap? Uh, landing on the ice cap uh, would be diff is difficult. You mean at Mars? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, let me talk a bit about landing at Mars. You know, there's been a huge failure rate for missions at Mars. I don't know if you read about that or not. Two-thirds of all missions flown to Mars have failed. I, the latest I heard were there were 29 U.S. and Soviet Union missions over history to Mars, and 18 of them had failed. <laughs> now, landing on Mars is especially difficult, and, and here are some of the reasons. Uh, you can't land really by parachute. Uh, because the atmosphere is so thin. It's true that the Mars rovers used a parachute, but you know what the descent rate on that parachute was? 175 miles an hour. <laughs> the atmosphere is so thin, not only that, they can't just land any place on Mars with a, you know, using the parachute technique. You have to land at the very lowest elevations where the air pressure is higher. You try to land on a high plateau, you can't even use a parachute. So, okay, that's why they had to use the retro rockets, the parachute, and then the retro rocket just before it hit to the surface and the airbags and so forth. I think there's only two techniques for landing on Mars uh, that uh, have been used. One is the retro rocket technique, which, uh, you know, you use a parachute. This is how Viking came down. They use a parachute for, well, first there's a heat shield to get you slowed down going through the atmosphere. You get down near the speed of sound. Then they, uh, then they use a parachute, and uh, then just above the surface, you jettison the parachute and fire some rockets. And the big design problem there is how much fuel to carry on the lander. You don't want to carry very much, but you want enough that the rocket doesn't stop before you get to the surface. Difficult problem. You also have to take out transverse velocities. There can be winds as high as 100 miles an hour at Mars. So you have to have a radar that senses the transverse motion and takes that out, you know, and then brings you down. It's really, it's tricky. Uh, okay, now, the poles. Poles are hard to get to. I don't know, just the orbital mechanics, it's easy to come in near the equator, more or less near the equator to land. Uh, the poles are more difficult. I, I don't know how you'd get up to the poles, actually. Uh, probably the way we're doing it with Mars Express. First you get the spacecraft in orbit, then you start making orbit adjustments until you get going over the poles. That, that's what they did with Mars Express here, actually. You notice that orbit uh, is over the, more or less over the poles now. What do they power those cars with? What do they power it with? Okay, his question is, what do they power the spacecraft with? Uh, okay, uh, the Viking was used a uh, radioactive heater, a radioactive power supply. And uh, I don't know, let's see, they use solar cells on the Mars rovers. They, they, they're using solar cells. You can still use solar cells out there, right? Okay. 
Where on the picture there? Uh, you know, I don't know if I can really identify that. I'd have to get myself another map. I, uh, I can't, can't really, I, I'm really not in the rover business. I watch it on TV and that's about it. <laughs> Maybe somebody else can come up. As time evolves, the high point on the orbit gradually moves around in a period of a couple of years, and that's, that makes the low point kind of scan around the planet. And meanwhile, the planet's rotating underneath, so pretty soon you build up a pretty, quite a you know, in two years you build up a reasonably complete map of Mars. That, that's how that's how we do it. 